College students, how are we? Well, good to see you. I'm pretty excited because last week, Apple released a couple of new devices. How many of you guys keeping up? You know about this, okay? We got new iPhones coming out, right? We got the 6, iPhone 6, which is kind of crazy, is bigger than the 5S, okay? 6 is bigger than 5S. And then they've got the 6 Plus. Did y'all see this thing? The 6 Plus. I mean, I cannot wait to see how this thing works. I mean, it looks kind of like this, so I can't, I can't wait to see somebody like, you know, in their phone call, hey, we'll see you later, and then try to put it in their front pocket. I mean, can you imagine watching somebody try to dig this in their pockets? It's going to be like swiping people as they walk by. I mean, the thing is huge, okay, but it's, it's going to be cool. And then maybe you heard about uh, Apple Pay. Did y'all hear about this? We're like, maybe you're gonna be able to get rid of your credit cards, won't need them anymore, because on your phone, they're like gonna store your card. And you're gonna be able to go to stores and check out just by putting your card, your phone up next to a card reader, and it'd be great. And I was following the live cast, and somebody tweeted this. He said, um, this is gonna enable an entirely new generation of horror movies about people lost in scary places with dead cell phones. All right, I mean, because credit cards are on your phone. I mean, it's like you can be trying to find an iPhone charger in a dark alley, okay? It's gonna be difficult, but... Hopefully, keep them charged. So, we're glad you're here uh, tonight. This is week four of a series we've been in called I Agree with Aaron. If you've missed any of the messages, uh, they're always available on our website at experiencelifenow.com. But in case you're like, who's Aaron? I don't know who Aaron is. I hadn't been here. Uh, Aaron is, was a college student that attended this college gathering last semester, and tragically, in May of this year, he died in a car accident. And he had loved coming here. God had changed his life by coming here. And he just believed it was important uh, to follow Jesus as a college student and to drag other people along with you as well. And that's what he did with his friends. He dragged his friends to come, and I'm sure he was instrumental in seeing some of his friends walk more closely with God. But he thought it was important for college students to follow Jesus. And I agree with Aaron. That's the title of the series. I agree with him. And I've been saying this series, I think you should too. And we said the reason is, because Jesus rose from the dead. And we said your college experience, various points, is gonna to try to undermine this statement, Jesus rose from the dead. Because if you can undermine the statement, then you can live however you want in college, right? That's what we've been saying. Paul said you can feast and drink for tomorrow you die. So party it up, live it up, tomorrow you're gonna die. If resurrection didn't happen, uh, people should pity us for even uh, believing in Jesus is, is what he said. But if the resurrection did happen, that is a historical event, then it should compel us to live for him who died for us and was raised again. Now I told you I was a coward uh, last week in college. I was in a circuits class in electrical engineering and professor started making some statements about the Bible being myth and I just, I didn't say anything. I knew it wasn't true. I knew some of the students in that classroom were probably buying what he was saying, but I just I didn't say anything. Well, I started discipling a guy uh, that I lived with a couple roommates uh, during college and just after college, his name was Kurt. And he had a speech class here at Texas Tech. And I told him, I said, Kurt, you know, um, when I was in college, I didn't stand up for my faith like I should have. So don't be a coward like me. Be courageous. He said, that's what I'm going to do. So in this speech class, you could speak about anything you wanted to. He preached the gospel <laughs> in his speech class. Defended the resurrection of Jesus in front of his class. Not going on the defensive, like it's not like the professor said anything. He's like, I'm going on the offensive. I know that people are uh, professors or classmates or friends or whatever are going to try to undermine these students' faith. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share why I believe and uh, what I believe and, and hope, hopefully uh, bolster their faith as well. And so I hope that some of you are as courageous as Kurt to when you take your speech class and you are terrified. You talk about something that really matters. And potentially you're able to help students who might be deceived by peers or whoever, that Jesus didn't rise from the dead, that in fact he did, you know because he's changed your life and because there's strong historical evidence. So be courageous in college. Stand up for what you believe because it's a reasonable faith. We're not, we're not asking anybody to take a leap of faith. This is a calculated step of faith in the direction of the evidence. Well, one of the central or the central historical event we've been talking about is the resurrection of Jesus. And we said, we need to make a case for this because people are going to call it into question. You need to know how to defend this. And so I've been telling you that we're going to do four historical facts that are granted by nearly every scholar that studies the subject. And uh, even the skeptical ones, both Christian and non-Christian scholars, so strongly attested historically that everybody pretty much grants them. And then we're going to add a fifth, one more next week. It's not granted by all scholars, 
Christian and non-Christian, but by many. So we're going to talk about that uh, next week. But let's do a brief review and then get into fact number four today. hope you're taking notes. Uh, this is what you can say if a professor or anybody else tries to tear down your faith. Fact number one is this. Jesus died by crucifixion. This was first week. Remember this? Jesus died by crucifixion. You find this inside the Bible and outside the Bible. There's no question. A man named Jesus lived and he died at the hands of the Romans in a horrible way by crucifixion. You've got to have a death to have a resurrection. Fact number two. Jesus' disciples believed that he rose from the dead and appeared to them. In order to have a resurrection, you got to have him appearing to some people, right? And they said, hey, hey, we saw him alive. He appeared to us. We well, you know it because they claimed it, one, and then two, they willingly suffered and died for it. And we said, you don't willingly die for something you know to be a lie. And the disciples were in a position to know if they were dying for a lie because they either saw him or they didn't. It wasn't something they believed to be true that somebody else told them. It's something they, had, they were firsthand witnesses of. They were there. They died for what they either knew or didn't know to be the truth. And they said, hey, this is the truth that Jesus rose from the dead. We're going to go to our deaths and you don't die for what you know to be a lie. Liars make bad martyrs. Showed you this even outside the Bible. Fact number three is this. The church persecutor, Paul, was suddenly changed. And remember last week we said enemy testimony is strong indication of authenticity. Paul was an enemy of Jesus. And yet he stood up for him against his friends who said he didn't rise from the dead. Paul said, he sure did. I saw him alive. And then Paul went to his death, proclaiming Jesus rose from the dead. You don't die for what you know to be a lie. So you've got enemy testimony. Then there's one more person I want to talk to you about today that is so surprising that he would claim he saw him and that he would claim that Jesus rose from the dead. You have any idea who I'm talking about? Fact number four. The skeptic, James, Jesus' brother was suddenly changed. Do you know Jesus had a brother? He had a couple of them. James, Judas, Joseph, Simon, maybe more. Some unnamed sisters. We know this even outside the Bible. This is what Josephus said. He, he's not a Christian. He's a Jewish historian. He said this. He had the brother of Jesus. Again, another reference to Jesus outside the Bible. The brother of Jesus, who was called the Christ, whose uh, name was James. So Jesus, this guy, historian, saying Jesus had a brother, his name was James. We know that there is this guy lived. And you know what it, James, the brother of Jesus, thought of his big brother Jesus? You know what he thought of him? <laughs> Look at this. <laughs> Mark, Mark's friends with Peter, who was there for all this. He's, Peter's teaching him. He's recording what Peter said from one of his gospels. Mark 3, 20, 21. One time Jesus entered a house and the crowds began to gather again. Soon he and his disciples couldn't even find time to eat. When his... Family heard what was happening. They tried to take him away. Here's what his family said. He's out of his mind, they said. This is his brothers, maybe his sister saying, hey, we're so, I'm sorry about Jesus. He's kind of crazy. Okay, claiming to be the son of God. I'm so sorry about him. Jesus, come on, take you home. All right, we can take you home. All right, that's what they're doing, okay? Because they're kind of ashamed of Jesus. This is what John said. John, disciple of Jesus, he said, for even his brothers, Jesus' his brothers, didn't believe in him. And can you blame him? What would your brother, how many of you guys have a brother? Just raise your hand. What would your brother have to do to convince you he was the son of God? <laughs> I mean, something amazing, right? You're like, dude, my brother is not even close. I mean, so, I mean, it would be terrible, you know, it, but now Jesus was perfect in every way. James knew that, but he's the son of God, and I don't know. He never got spanked. He never understood that. And so, uh, anyways, but, you know, he didn't believe, and it's kind of, I don't make sense, I guess. Jesus is his, Big brother, son of God, really? Savior of the world? Didn't believe until something happened. You know what happened? Paul tells us. Remember oral tradition? This is within five years of the crucifixion. Paul's not saying this. He got this from the disciples. Christ died for our sins, just as the scriptures said. <clears throat> he was buried. And he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scriptures said. He was seen by Peter and then by the 12. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time. We talked about that. Most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he was seen, oral tradition. Then he was seen by James and later by all the apostles. Can you imagine how that conversation went? <laughs> 
James doesn't believe his brother. He's like my big brother. You're not who you claim to be. Then Jesus appears to James alive. James is probably like, I'm just kidding. I'm sorry. It don't hurt me. I surrender all. I mean, I'll do whatever. I mean, I'm sorry. I don't even know. I don't even know. Jesus, I don't even know. I mean, can you imagine the conversation? You are who you claim to be. I didn't, I didn't even know. They killed you, but you're alive. You're alive. The only way James, the brother of Jesus, is going to be persuaded, his brother's the son of God, is if he saw him risen from the dead. He probably wouldn't even believe it if somebody told him. He'd probably have to see it himself. Paul says, suddenly, he's changed. The skeptic James, now a convert and a follower of Jesus, his brother. Look at some of what we learn about him in the New Testament. Galatians 1, 18, 19, Paul says this about him. Three years later, I went to Jerusalem to get to know Peter, and I stayed with him for 15 days. The only other apostle I met at that time was James, the Lord's brother. What did he just call James? An apostle. <laughs> somebody who's seen Jesus and somebody who was sent by Jesus. Paul calls James the skeptic, the brother of Jesus, who was saying, hey, y'all, I'm sorry for my brother. I'm dragging him away from the party, all right? Like he's thinking he's crazy. The skeptic is now an apostle. What? Another thing we find out. Look at this. Acts 15, 12, and 13. This is Dr. Luke. Remember him? Dr. Luke. Everyone listened quietly. As Barnabas and Paul told about the miraculous signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. When they had finished... James stood and said, brothers, listen to me. James is the leader of this meeting. Seems like from Acts 15, James was the first senior pastor of the first church in Jerusalem who gathered together to worship his brother. And this whole meeting was about whether Gentiles have to have surgery to get saved on like lower parts, okay? Whether they have to be, some of you are like, what are you talking about? Circumcision, okay? As the Jews were saying, all right. Jews were saying, hey, if these guys are going to be saved, like become followers of Jesus, they need to become like Jewish too. So they got to be circumcised. And all the Gentile men who want to follow Jesus but not be circumcised, like, please, God, don't make us do that, okay? And so James said, James said, no, nope, they don't have to. They're saved by grace just as we are. They're throwing a party in the back seat, the Gentiles, men and boys. And uh, so they're excited. They don't have to do that. And they can become Christians, okay? But... James is the guy making the call. The church in Jerusalem. Skeptic turn, senior pastor of church, a church that worships his brother. It gets better. James writes a letter to this church scattered out due to persecution. <laughs> Look at what he said, first verse in his letter, James 1.1. This letter is from James. Here's what I consider myself. A slave of God and a slave of God. Of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, just want you to know, church, as I'm writing to you, I consider myself a slave of my brother. He's who he claimed to be. I saw him alive. I'll do whatever he tells me to do. I'm his slave. Skeptic turned slave. How do you get that? How do you get there? You got to have a resurrection from the dead. Some other parts of his letter. Check this out. How he described his brother, James 2.1. My dear brothers and sisters, how can you claim to have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ if you favor some people over others? How many of you guys have a brother again? Just by show of hands, brother again. How many of you have ever called your brother glorious? Raise your hand. Glorious? Okay, no. It doesn't happen, all right? He's he says his brother is glorious. What would have to happen for you to ever call your sibling Glorious. I mean, something glorious would have to happen, all right, for sure, and it hadn't happened so far. But with Jesus, it did. He rose from the dead. Another thing he said in his letter, James' letter, 2, 7, 2, chapter 2, verse 7. Aren't they the ones who slander Jesus Christ, whose noble name you bear? Hey, by the way, just wanted you guys to know the people I'm writing to, James saying, hey, Jesus Christ, my brother, he's got a noble name. He's a, he's a glorious Lord. He's a glorious Savior. This is James, the skeptic, the brother that didn't believe. Now, calling his brother glorious and saying his name is a noble name. How do you get there? The only way to explain it is James must have seen him alive. Keep going. Look at this. James went to his death proclaiming this. They stoned him. 
to death. It's not just, uh, you know, Christian sources that tell you this. It's non-Christian sources too. Josephus, again, non-Christian Jewish historian. Hegesippus, Clement of Alexandria, these two are Christian sources. Both attest, all these outside the Bible, all three attest to the fact that James died by stoning. Not only is he calling his brother glorious, not only is he saying he appeared to him alive, he's saying, I believe it so strongly. He saved me and forgave me and changed my life. I'm willing to go to my death for him. You can stone me to death if you want, but I will not recant. And I will not stop proclaiming to the world that Jesus, my big brother, he's who he claimed to be. He rose from the dead. College students, I'm telling you, as you're talking about the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus, this is strong. You've got an enemy in Paul, and you've got a skeptic in James, and suddenly they're changed. Two people you wouldn't expect to be claiming Jesus appeared to them alive. Now, there's some people that would say this. Chris, here's the thing. Here's, here's Chris. Let me help you out, okay? I don't care how much evidence you show us that points in the direct direction of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. I'm not going to believe it because I don't believe in resurrections. I'm a naturalist. That's what a lot of people say about this whole thing. Even if they would admit, atheists admit, that the evidence is compelling, they say, I still don't believe it, even if it's compelling, because I don't believe in resurrections. This is what this is called. This is called an a priori argument. If you study philosophy, they'll explain this. A priori argument, essentially what you're saying is, I don't care what evidence is shown, I'm not going to follow it to the conclusion you're saying the evidence leads to, because I'm biased against the conclusion. That's an a priori argument. That's what, you know, a naturalist would make. I, even if the evidence is strong, Chris, even if I said, oh, okay, there's no way a resurrection didn't happen, I would still say a resurrection didn't happen because they don't happen. This is naturalism. You know, you know this philosophy, right? You heard of naturalism? Here's what naturalism is. This is by Dr. Habermas, Gary Habermas. And a lot of the content in this series, in case you're wanting to read up more on this, you can find a lot of this, these facts. I'm not making this up. That's a good thing, okay, that I'm not the first person to say this. It's in a book written by Dr. Habermas called The Case for the Resurrection of Jesus. So if you want to look more into this, uh, kind of as a supplement to the series, you can look up uh, more info in this book. Anyways, he talks about naturalism kind of as an objection to the resurrection of Jesus. And this is what he says. He says, naturalism views the natural world as the sum of reality, <clears throat> usually holding that scientific investigation is the best or even the only path to knowledge and that only material phenomena are real. Those who embrace naturalism hold that there is no such thing as a supernatural realm, hence they're naturalists, not supernaturalists. God cannot be tested empirically, that is by observation and experiment or by any other means. And so many of them would say, therefore, there is no God and supernatural things like this whole resurrection thing, even if there's strong evidence, they just don't happen. Here's the problem with all of that. Is we believe all kinds of things are true and we trust them, even though we can't prove them scientifically. You know this, right? How do you know George Washington was the first president of this country? Can you prove that scientifically? You cannot. We don't live during that time. We don't, we don't have DNA samples, okay? You, know, you can't know George Washington was the first president of the country based on science alone or a scientific investigation. You have to employ another enterprise to know George Washington was the first president, namely the historical enterprise. And people believe, even scientists, that the historical enterprise is a reliable way to know things. Just because we can't prove it scientifically, does that mean we shouldn't believe George Washington isn't the first president of the country? No, absolutely. We should still, absolutely not. We should still believe that he is, not because science can show us, because it can't, but because historical inquiry can show us. You know what's interesting about the historical enterprise, which is a reliable way of knowing things, in addition to science, is that with the historical enterprise, you can see that Jesus was a known miracle worker. Here's what it said about Jesus in some ancient documents. Josephus, again, a, a Jewish historian, said that Jesus was a doer of marvelous works. He wasn't a Christian, but he was saying, hey, this guy, Jesus, he was known to do miracles. 
Can't prove it scientifically, but the historical enterprise shows that it was true. Keep going. The Talmud, these are Jewish writings. Clearly, the Jews didn't believe Jesus was who he claimed to be. The Talmud, in the Talmud, Jesus was accused as one who practiced sorcery. What they meant by that is like magic or miracles. He was doing things that were, that was miraculous, that were miraculous, and people couldn't explain them. Another example, Celsus, second century critic of Christianity, not a Christian. He said this, this is outside the Bible. He says, having been brought up as an illegitimate child, he's talking about Jesus, and having served for hire in Egypt, and then coming to the knowledge of certain miraculous powers, returned from thence to his own country, and by means of those powers proclaimed himself a God. So you've got a guy outside the Bible saying, hey, Jesus, everybody knows he was a known miracle worker. You can't prove it scientifically, but you can prove it historically. And the historical enterprise is a reliable way of knowing things. One more. In the Bible, Matthew said this, chapter 9, 32 and following. When they left, a demon-possessed man who couldn't speak was brought to Jesus. So Jesus cast out the demon, and then the man began to speak. The crowds were amazed. Nothing like this has ever happened in Israel, they exclaimed. But the Pharisees said, his enemies, they said, he can cast out demons because he's empowered by the prince of demons. So they didn't deny that he could do it. They just said, yeah, he can do it. We, uh, we give him credit. Okay, we're his enemies. We don't like Jesus, but we give him credit. He can do miracles. There's no question. He just cast out the demon, uh, this guy, okay? He, he, can do, he can do miracles. It's just not the power of God enabling him to do miracles. It's the power of Satan. Even his enemies gave Jesus credit for doing miracles. So the fact that this Jesus guy is a known historical miracle worker should make us take the resurrection even more seriously. He's not just some random guy off the street. He, ran, he totally changed the world. So here's a question people ask. Has science really proven that resurrections from the dead are impossible? Has science proven they're impossible? Absolutely not. All science has shown is resurrections from the dead don't happen by natural means or with natural causes. You can't go into a laboratory and take these, a dead person or a dead thing and get the cells together and you make it alive again. You can, I mean, you can't raise something from the dead by natural causes. But here's the thing. Jesus' resurrection doesn't apply here. You know why? Nobody's claiming Jesus rose from the dead by natural causes. The claim of the New Testament is that God raised Jesus from the dead. In order to figure out if that's true, you've got to employ another enterprise. Can't employ the scientific enterprise. I mean, using science to try to prove that Jesus rose from the dead is like using world geography to try to prove that two plus two is four. It's two different subjects. Science is studying natural causes in our natural world. You want to know about supernatural things, God raising Jesus from the dead, You've got to look somewhere. You've got to use another enterprise, like history. And that's why in this series we've been looking at the historical enterprise, a reliable way to know things. Even scientists say that because scientists, they build their discoveries, their current discoveries on past discoveries. And so they're trusting history so they don't have to do that experiment again. They're trusting that that discovery happened and that they can build off of that knowledge. So even scientists would say the historical enterprise is a reliable way of knowing things. And that's where we have to look in order to confirm that Jesus rose from the dead. So science doesn't prove resurrections don't happen. It just proves they don't happen by natural causes. But nobody's claiming that. The New Testament says God raised him from the dead. So how do we determine if that's true? History. Look in history. Do we have strong historical evidence that Jesus did, in fact, come back from the dead? And we do. So any reasonable naturalist would have to go, hey, I, I can't do the a priori argument here. I've got to consider the evidence because I can't assume that science is going to tell me about supernatural causation. It doesn't do that. It's a different subject. I've got to use another enterprise to figure out if there was supernatural causation here. So you can't just let the naturalist off scot-free. Just with these four historical facts, there's strong historical evidence that Jesus came back from the dead. But there's one more. There's a fifth. And not everybody agrees that this actually happened. But a majority of scholars do, although not all. And I'm going to talk to you about that one next week. But it's going to blow you away. I mean, this is the nail in the coffin. These four can already lead you to the conclusion it had to be a resurrection. But the fifth one, oh my goodness, 
once you hear this, there's really no explanation for it other than the fact that Jesus came back from the dead. As I conclude, I want to talk to you just for a minute about what was happening as the disciples were going out after they saw Jesus risen from the dead, as they were going out and telling others about his resurrection. I want to show you what happened. Uh, it talks about it some in Acts chapter 2, and uh, the disciples were all meeting together, and they were filled with the early church, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. They started speaking in other languages, if you hadn't read it before. And people were gathering around, and everybody was hearing them speak in their language, different people in Jerusalem during that time, and they spoke other languages. And they heard these guys speaking their languages, and they knew they didn't know their languages. And so they were like, these guys must be drunk. Like, they're accusing them of being drunk or something. And so Peter gets up, and he starts preaching to them, and the first thing he says is, hey, um, these guys aren't drunk. It's only 9 o'clock in the morning. 9 o'clock in the morning is way too early for anybody to be drunk. That's what Peter said. And plus, when you get drunk, you can't speak other languages, okay? You have trouble speaking your own language, <laughs> much less speaking Chinese or something. I mean, you, you, get China, you can't do Chinese, all right? You're struggling just to walk, okay? And so he's saying it's 9 o'clock in the morning. These guys aren't drunk. And then he goes on and he preaches to them. This guy, this Peter, the coward that betrayed Jesus, now he's up in front of all these people because he saw them alive. And he's preaching to them. And this, is what he, this is what he preaches. This, is, this was the core point of their message, Acts 2.32. God raised Jesus from the dead, and we are all witnesses of this. We were there. We were there. We've seen him. He's alive. And then a few verses later, he keeps going. Verse 36. So let everyone in Israel know for certain that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, to be both Lord and Messiah. Peter's words pierced their hearts. They said to him and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? We're convicted. We believe he rose. We put him on the cross. What do we do? Peter replied, Each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So they were preaching, Hey, Jesus rose from the dead. He rose from the dead. People were like, Okay, okay, all right. I, I get it. I believe. I believe. What do I do? What am I supposed to do? He said, I want you to do two things. Number one, I want you to repent and turn to God. In other words, I want you to commit your life to follow this Jesus that you now believe rose from the dead. And when you make that commitment to follow Jesus, he's saying, Peter is, your sins will be forgiven. So first of all, that's good news. That our sins can be forgiven, not by us being a good enough person. We'll never be good enough. Our standard for heaven's moral perfection. We're never going to make it on our own. So the good news of the gospel is Jesus died, rose from the dead, and offers to forgive us and give us his righteousness as a free gift. If we'll repent, means just means big word, meaning turn from your sin, and we'll turn to Jesus and say, Jesus, I need you to save me from hell, which is what I deserve. Give me heaven, which I don't. That's the good news of the gospel. He says yes, regardless of where you've been, what you've done, what names you've called him. And you can know for sure you make that decision. Your sins are forgiven, and you're going straight. Uh, to heaven when you die. So, number one, he said, repent, turn to God. Commit your life to Christ. Your sins will be forgiven. Then number two, he said, get baptized. And here's what's amazing about baptism. Have you ever thought about it before? If you weren't raised in church and you've thought about it, it's a strange symbol, right? People get in like a, you know, pool of water somewhere, some kind of a tank or like a lake or something, and they're like submerged in this water and they come back up again. Like, what is that? Like, that's, a, that's like a weird symbol. What's awesome about baptism is you know what it's a symbol of if you think about it? Somebody's belief that the resurrection happened. Peter said, don't just repent and turn to Jesus. I want you to get baptized as your way of telling the world, I believe in the resurrection of Jesus. Because think about the symbol. Somebody's dunked underwater. That's like death. That's like burial in a grave. Because if they hold you underwater, what's going to happen? And that, that could happen. Not, not here, but some, some places. You'll drown, okay? So it's like death. Symbolizes death and burial in this water, Okay. And then you come out, and pastor will say, raised to walk a new kind of life, and it symbolizes resurrection, right? You're dead and buried in resurrection. So it was a powerful symbol to the world that somebody believed in the resurrection of Jesus. A lot of people didn't, but these guys are going around saying he rose from the dead, and then he said, if you believe it, here's what I want you to do. Repent, get saved, and then tell the world by going under the water and coming back up again is your declaration that you believe in the resurrection of Jesus. I mean, it was a, it was a powerful picture. People were shocked. Oh, wow, what is that? Oh, it's, it's somebody's belief, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. So he said, I want you to commit your life to Jesus. He said, and then 
I want you to get baptized. Let the world know you believe in the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, that it was sufficient to save you from your sin. Here's what happened after he preached to him. Here's what happened. Those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day about 3,000 of them in all. They were all like, I'll get baptized right now. Thank you. Okay. I believe. I believe. Right, let's go. Where's some water? We got water? Okay. Where's the water? Let's, let's do this thing now. And so that day, that day, no, okay. That day they got baptized. They didn't wait. They have to pray about it and they didn't go talk to somebody about it. They just said, if that's the symbol that I believe in the resurrection of Jesus, then somebody dunked me today. And 3,000 of them in that day believed and they got baptized. Some of you have gotten to this point in a series and maybe you started out a skeptic, but you feel like God's speaking to you through these messages. And maybe you've come to believe that Jesus rose from the dead and you're ready to commit your life to him. I challenge you to do that. And then I challenge you to go public and let the world know you believe in the resurrection by getting baptized. And I'd love to see many of you do it today. If God's brought you to that point where you've committed your life to Christ and you're ready to say, I believe in the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, baptism's the way he said we should do it. And so what's really cool this evening is that we've got quite a few college students already signed up to get baptized tonight. They've already let us know, hey, this is a next step that I want to take. And so they're signed up. But what we like to do sometimes is go book of Acts style. <clears throat> we do this at our other campuses too. And we just want to do it uh, for you guys because I'm thinking there's some people here that uh, are ready to go. But book of Acts style just says, hey, I'm getting baptized today. I don't care if I go home soaking wet, all right? I want the world to know I believe in the resurrection of Jesus and I have committed my life to him. And then you can walk back to your dorm or your apartment or whatever drenched with a towel around you. People are like, what in the world do you do? You tell them, hey, I went to this church. I believe in the resurrection of Jesus. And there's this powerful symbol that demonstrates my belief. And I was buried with Christ and raised to walk in a new kind of life. College students, why not tonight? If you haven't committed your life to Christ, why not commit your life to Christ tonight? This is a point of decision. At some point, you got to decide, is he who he claimed to be or is he not? And if he is, be bold and declare your faith in his claim by getting baptized. So two groups of people that can get baptized tonight. First, if you're committing your life to Christ, get baptized tonight. Just like them. Go book an Acts style. Come on. Go book in the rain in a hot pool. It's going to be awesome. All right. Go book an Acts style. Get baptized tonight. Second group is if you have committed your life to Christ, but you have not been baptized since then, you should get baptized tonight. Why don't you join the college students that are already signed up? You say, well, I was already baptized as a baby. Well, here's the thing about that. Your parents did that for you. Okay. It's like a baby dedication. But at that point, you, know, you can pee and poop and sleep. I mean, you didn't, you didn't know what you were doing, okay? Or when you were seven years old, or even if you were 16, if somebody pressured you to do something like this, but it was not a demonstration of your own belief in the resurrection of Jesus from the dead and your own commitment to Christ, you should get rebaptized. You see that in the Bible. We say, see that at our church all the time. So do it based on your own profession of faith, not just your parents. Be thankful for what your parents did for you. But now, based on your own profession of faith, say, I believe, though, Mom and Dad, I guarantee you, I think they should be if they wouldn't be. So proud of you for that decision that you make. So if you have committed your life to Christ, not been baptized since then, tonight's your night. Tonight's your night. So here's what we're going to do in just a second. First of all, Mark's going to come sing you a song that he wrote so that you just kind of know how this thing's going to go down. This is not a powerful spiritual song at all, okay? This is a funny clap your hands, think Mark's goofy kind of song, okay? And then after he's done, I'm gonna pray that some of you would have courage that weren't signed up to get baptized tonight. And then I'm gonna have everybody stand and dismiss you out the back and we're gonna baptize a bunch of people hopefully and maybe stand in the rain while we're doing it. It's gonna be powerful. Aren't you guys excited about that? Wouldn't it be cool to baptize a ton of college students tonight? It'd be great. But let's let Mark, first of all, sing us a little song. So I did not write this song. I rewrote this song. Uh, to the popular tune called Rude, which is about a, uh, a butthead asking his girlfriend's dad to marry him. But girls, if you take a guy home and your dad doesn't like him, it's probably because you're too good for him, so dump him. I don't know. Side note, all right. Whoa. 
walked in these doors, but you didn't guess that you could get dunked tonight. But now here we are, I'm singing this song to convince you otherwise. So let me explain how this will work. Since no one has swim trunks, when laundry day comes, you'll have a head start. Yeah. First you're gonna stand and head to the back Sign a little tar, get into a line Gonna step out in the pool, smile big and snap a pig Nod your head and say, yes, I've committed my life to Christ We haven't drowned a person yet Just hold your nose and don't you fret If you drown, we'll give you a Corvette Nothing else rhymes with Corvette, ooh Tonight is your night. Ooh, ooh, ooh. My bandy's coming off. That's really gross. To get baptized at Eli. Have the time of your life. And people say it's kind of fun. Oh, 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 oh. To get dumped at Eli. I hate to do this, you leave no choice I'm on a Jesus juke you So lend me your ears and maybe you'll learn Where excuses get you Jesus is up in heaven right now Hearing all your weak songs But what is a pool compared to a cross? Boom, roasted That was a little rude Jesus probably will still love you Even if you don't do What it's telling you to do Don't be that guy That chickens out tonight You'll regret it and cry You'll feel like the poop-shaped emojicon Ooh, oh Nobody's friends with that guy. Ooh, 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 oh. You take a pic and then get dumped. You need a profile pic anyways. Post it online. You'll get a thousand likes. But you won't if you don't. Get dumped at Eli. Ooh, It's really, really, really cool ooh, 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 ooh. And it's really, really warm in the pool If like half the room doesn't get dunked after that, I, mean, I don't know, we don't have anything else, all right, so. On that note, I want to pray for you and all of us. Lord, help us. Okay, and uh, you'd have courage if this is uh, your night and you know that uh, God's leading you to go public, then let's do it tonight. Jesus, thanks for this series. Thanks for this evidence for the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. God, would you give college students tonight courage to go public, to not care if they came ready or not, not care if they go home soaking wet or not, the courage to get in that pool and say, I believe in the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And I'm trusting in him to save me. And I'm believing that he has as a symbol of that. I'm going through death, burial, and resurrection figuratively so that my friends in this world knows I'm a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. God, we baptized a ton of college students last semester and I pray we baptize a ton more tonight. I need your help. Help us do, Lord, sometimes what's difficult to do. You took a stand for us. Help us to be willing to take a stand for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for checking out one of our messages today. For more information about our church or to watch other messages, you can go to our website at experiencelifenow.com. Let us know if we can serve you in any way, and we hope to see you real soon.